Hello everybody and welcome to the first in a series of conversations around the cost of living crisis. My name is Matthew Batten, I'm the Director of Communications in the Diocese of Llandaff and I'm currently also working with the Archbishop of Wales uh, on the Church of Wales's Food and Fuel campaign which is uh, aims to tackle Wales's cost of living crisis. I'm joined today by uh, Bishop Barry Morgan, former Archbishop of Wales and Canon Dr Tristan Hughes um, and we're today going to have a conversation looking at the Christian biblical response to the cost of living crisis. So why, basically the question we're asking and we're going to be discussing today is why do churches, why do Christians get involved in campaigning for uh, equality and ending poverty. So these are our um, guests today. Um, over the series of uh, months, we'll be interviewing lots of other people. Uh, there'll be conversations in Welsh as well. Uh, but uh, for now, we're going to kick off with our very first conversation. Uh, and I'm going to be the host and start asking Tristan and Barry some questions. So how are you both today? Are you ready for our conversation? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> OK, I'm going straight in with the heavyweights here. OK, so uh, I've been reading the Theology of Liberation, Gustavo Gutierrez, and I just want to read a quote from this because I thought this was something that really jumped out of me as a lead into uh, to some of our questions today. And he says about liberation theology, it seeks to show that unless we make an ongoing commitment to the poor, who are the privileged members of the reign of God, we are far removed from the Christian message, which I think is a really powerful statement. So my first question to you then is, what role should churches play in addressing poverty and injustice? Tristan, should we start with you? Well, I think it's a great quotation, by the way, that the churches need to play an absolutely central role, um, as you say, in addressing the challenges of, of poverty and, and justice. If, if we abandon people experiencing poverty, then we're abandoning the gospel because uh, poverty robs people of dignity. It robs people of worth. It robs people of value. Uh, and, and so that challenge of those who are struggling to make ends meet uh, has to be central to our faith. Uh, when you think of biblical theology, when you think of the Bible, uh, our understanding of the gospel throughout the whole of Christian tradition, uh, at the heart of God's character, at the heart of uh, God's movement in the world um, is concern, uh, is compassion, is concern for, uh, and care for the poor and for others, from the teachings of the Torah to the prophetic <clears throat> tradition, um, to the story of Jesus and, and Jesus's life and the early church. So it's, it's outrageous what we're facing at the moment. Uh, the sixth largest economy in the world, uh, and we have people living in poverty. We have families, even families who are in employment, uh, depending on food banks to survive. Uh, now, the cost of living crisis will impact each and every one of us, but to some, of course, it will be far more acute. And so the challenge to the churches in facing this is clear and is huge. It's not just uh, about being hungry. It's not just about being cold. People suffer in all sorts of ways because of the people are suffering and will suffer in all sorts of ways because of the cost of living crisis. The amount of people, for example, that are, uh, are suffering with ill health over the past few months uh, is is soaring. Uh, there's a sense of shame involved in, in poverty, um, not to mention anxiety, worry. Economic poverty can have a, a devastating impact on our communities and the church need to be there reaching out and offering God's love. Well, there's an opener for you. That is a fantastic, uh, a fantastic response. Bishop Barry, wondered what your thoughts are on that one. Yeah, I think that quotation actually goes, as Tristan has said, to the heart of the gospel. The trouble is, of course, that there are Christians and non-Christians who think that the Christian faith is about just about fostering your relation, personal relationship with God and that actually it's not about this world at all. It's about uh, another world, the world to come. Now, it is important to foster a relationship um, with God. 
Um, and of course, we believe that beyond this world, there is another life. But at the minute, this is all we've got. And if you look at the Bible, there are more verses on poverty in the Bible than on any other single subject. Wow. And if you look at the prophetic tradition, then the prophets are adamant that God is not interested in worship that does not also take care of the poor. If you look at the prophet Amos, he says, I hate, I despise your feast days because it's not accompanied by right living. They're not looking after the fatherless, the widows, the orphans and the poor. When Jesus comes to Nazareth, um, according to St. Luke, his first public statement is to open uh, the book of Isaiah and to say that he has come to uh, anoint the good news to the poor, to proclaim release for captives, to recovery of sight for the blind, to let broken victims go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. In other words, the year of Jubilee, where um, allegedly um, everybody who was in debt was set free from debt. And in his ministry, of course, he goes out of his way to touch all those people who had been marginalised by his own society, um, be they because of their sex or because of their, they were children or because they were poor. And of course, he sums up the whole of the commandments by saying, you must do two things. You must love God and you must love your neighbor. Now, what is the Good Samaritan all about if it's not about caring for the, for, for the needy? So there is this theological justification, it seems to me, um, in addressing this question. So when people say to us, what's it got to do with the church? It's got everything to do with the church, because in fact, it's based on biblical foundations, if you like. But of course, it's not enough just to preach the gospel. Um, you have to live out the gospel. And it seems to me that the church is at the forefront there in doing things. For example, Christians are involved in food banks. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're, we're now opening up churches so that people can feel warm. People who can't afford to heat their homes can go to church halls. We supply food for them. Um, so all of that is, is necessary. Compassion, in other words, for those who are poor. But at the end of the day, compassion is not enough. Important as it is, we need justice um, because this ought not to be happening. I mean, the best example I can give you is that um, if I've got an uneven path in my garden and my grandchildren keep on falling on it um, and all I do is put plaster on their knees every time they fall, then I'm not actually addressing the real problem. The real problem is the uneven path. Um, so I must get somebody to repair that path and then they won't fall down. And then, you know, and in much the same way, it seems to me that we've got to address the root causes of poverty um, in this in this country. So we've got to press the government um, in order to address some of the underlying issues, such as a living wage, uh, proper housing, better care for people in terms of benefit. And I know that um, we'll be criticised for getting involved in all of that, but I think it was Helder Camara, the uh, Cardinal of Bishop of Brazil, who once said, well, when I help the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why people are poor, um, they call me a communist. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> I think that's a really good question, actually, because um, something that's been on my mind a lot is when I'm <clears throat> working on the food and fuel campaign is the word campaign. Yeah. And I think, is that getting in the way of people in the church thinking of getting involved? Do they think of the church as as more as providers of social care? So, you know, providing the food banks, providing the warm hubs. But do you think people are less comfortable or less confident in the church being able to instigate change. So should the church be campaigning for this? Should we be getting involved in politics? Well, well, of course, I mean, you know, it all depends what you mean by politics. I mean, when people talk about politics, they inevitably think about party politics. That's not what you're talking about. Mm. Um, politics mm. comes from the word polis, meaning city in, 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 in the Greek language. And it's how we organize ourselves in society. That's what politics is all about. Um, and it seems to me that um, if we are not interested in how we organize our society, then we've abandoned any concern for anybody other than ourselves, really. That's I mean, a good point. We believe that, you know, God created 
the world. Now, when God created the world, he didn't create it in order that we might just worship him. He's concerned in his creation about his creatures, and therefore he's concerned about every single issue in this world, inequality, poverty, war, violence. And therefore, if God is concerned about those things, then we ought to be as well, because, of course, we're made in his image. And we've got to remember, of course, that as Christians, we are members of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, that means that we're in a relationship with Jesus as head. But actually, uncomfortable though it might be, we're actually in relationship with one another as well. And, um, you know, sometimes we'd much prefer just to have a relationship with God or with Jesus and forget that we are actually in a vertical relationship with everybody else who's related to Jesus as well. And that's what um, getting involved in politics means. It's getting involved in the life and death issues of our time. And that inevitably means, I think, um, campaigning and striving for a better world and country. Yeah. Fantastic. Tristan, yeah, go ahead. Completely. The uh, as you say, the arc of the biblical narrative is for justice, it's for fairness, it's for equality. Um, and as Barry's just said, they are political matters. Yeah. Um, so right from the beginning of creation narratives, we hear, as Barry mentioned now, that we are made in God's image. That's only yeah. one little verse in the whole of scripture. But the implications of that verse are profound. If we reflect, if all people reflect God's image, then we're duty bound to care for one another. And poverty robs people of what God intends. Uh, it inverts God's desire for his creation. And, and therefore, if you think of it in that way, it's little wonder <clears throat> that in the New Testament, we see Jesus tell us that we see God in the face of the poor. Uh, it's an amazing passage uh, and parable in Matthew 25. Truly, I tell you, uh, just as you did for the least of these, you did for me. But what's even more amazing for me is the verse that comes a couple of verses after that. Uh, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. In other words, it's not just about what we do for others. It's also about what we're not doing for others and that's that's the challenge i think so that's the challenge and that is that requires a commitment it requires a commitment to social action yeah. it requires a, a commitment to justice and it requires a commitment to politics god is present uh, in people who are struggling god is present in people who are struggling uh financially uh, and in other ways and so when we christians offer hope, offer warmth, offer light, offer nourishment, then we're not just living as Jesus wanted us to, we're living as Jesus did. And so we also have the, the, the model of Jesus there to look at. So in the light of this biblical call for justice, uh, for social action, in the light of Jesus's life, in the light of Jesus's teaching, we can't be um, Ambival ambivalent uh, in a political way or in a social way. Uh, we can't be ambivalent when surveys are showing that one in seven adults in the UK have skipped meals or yeah. routinely gone without food over the last few months. We can't be ambivalent when the number of workers in zero hours contract in the UK have increased fivefold in 10 years. And we certainly can't be ambivalent when we hear dreadful stories, as we've heard recently about people having to eat pet food or having to try and heat food on radiators or candles. Uh, so we need to be involved. As we need to be angry as well, yeah. don't we? Yeah, because everything that diminishes or dehumanizes another human being actually diminishes and dehumanizes um, me as well. Yeah. Um, I'm involved because I have to care for my neighbor. I watched something ridiculous on the television the other day. Um, there was this man who had been a Christian missionary um, and um, he still went to church, uh, but he now ran a brothel. And so the interviewer said to him, um, well, hang on a minute, how do you square that with, it, with your faith? And he said, well, I believe in Jesus. Um, what I do with the rest of my life doesn't matter. And I thought, well, you know, it's it's the very opposite of what the Christian faith is all about. It's got everything to do with what you do with the rest of your life. Because you act, if you actually believe in the Lordship of Jesus, then he's the Lord of all of life. He's not just the, the Lord of the religious bit, as it were. 
Mm. Yeah, and I think as well that being a Christian should be a challenge as well. It cannot, it's not a cosy lifestyle, is it? Because no. I do think sometimes we're, we are lumbered with this Jesus meek and mild persona that um, that I just don't think is a reality, really. Because, you know, as you say, he talks more about poverty and more about justice and change. <clears throat> and I think that is you know that and and he was one for action as well you know through words through uh, through deeds as well and i think that as as someone as a role model is something that that can really really inspire us as well and of course he spent most of his life not in synagogues and temples but out of doors absolutely and sometimes i think christians forget that jesus was a layman um and very often reform um, within the church has come from lay people, you know, when you think about a good point. Lisa Francis and people like that. That's a really good point. Um, the other the other book I've been reading as well is Trinity and Society by Leonardo Boff as well, which, to be honest, I have read the ink out of this book. It's, <laughs> it's probably the one I go to when I need that little bit of boost um, for, for, you know, when you think the world's getting you down and this is all <laughs> hopelessness because you've read these awful stories of people going through so much and, you know, it can be quite overwhelming. But it's what he talks about the Trinity, because uh, Bishop Barry, was something that you said that when someone is is degraded you're degraded as well that it, it mm. that it affects you which really caught me because what what boff says is the sort of society that would emerge from inspiration by the trinitarian model would be one of fellowship equality of opportunity generosity in the space available for personal and group expression only a society of sisters and brothers whose social fabric is woven out of the participation and communion of all in everything can justifiably claim to be in the image and likeness of the Trinity. And there for me is that model of concern, isn't it? Because we are the body of Christ, our yeah. concern for one another and link that to, to the biblical teaching, link that to what Gutierrez was saying about, you know, the priority of the poor has yeah. always been at the top of the priority. And and that I find for me is is the calling. And if we believe in that Trinitarian God, then we are caring for each other. We cannot afford to ignore that. Yeah, because um, I heard Sam Wells, the vicar of um, St. Martin's the Field, oh, that's right. on the radio the other day. And he said, um, we believe in this country in both liberty and equality and um, all of us are prepared to give up some of our liberties, like paying taxes, in order to make our society more equal. And then he said, and when you think about it, that's what the God of Jesus does. He gives up his liberty in order to become human, in order that we might become divine. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> oh, that's good. who is giving up um, his power, as it were, in order um to, to to raise the rest of us up and and i mean that that's an image that's kind of stuck in my mind ever since and of course the foundational story of israel was the exodus here mm. is the god who hears his people are in misery and in slavery and he empowers moses to free them now he doesn't free them in order that they might worship him he frees them from economic serfdom and political slavery and you know takes them into a promised land a land flowing with milk and honey so god is concerned with every single aspect of life and because of that so ought we to be wow that's brilliant that's brilliant have you read um timothy radcliffe's why go to church Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. I'm reading it at the moment, right? And I, I keep asking people if they read it and everyone says to me, yeah, now there's like the book to read. The, the, the best the best story in that book, just to be lighthearted for the minute yeah. that I enjoyed was um, uh, um, a mother goes up to her son's bedroom and says, come on, get up. It's Sunday morning. Um, uh, you, you've got to go to church. And uh, he, the, the, the thing, the, the, the boy comes back and says, why should I go to church? Well, first of all, it's Sunday, she says. And second, you're the bishop of the diocese. <laughs> <laughs> it's a brilliant, brilliant story. So many funny ones. The one that I've just, I just finished the chapter reading about the Eucharistic prayer and talking about how, you know, God has given us is giving us so much and we take from that the love the compassion all the things you talked about um and through the eucharistic prayer when we pr process up with our gifts 
it's to remove that shame of just always being given to that we have that opportunity to give as well which i thought really took mm. that that shame out of accepting gifts mm. from other people because i wonder some people go to food banks and probably feel this great deal of shame but actually for christians it is an absolute privilege and a joy to be giving isn't it as well so yeah. um it was just something that that, that struck me in, in what you said there sorry tristan go ahead no yeah i, I agree no i'm just building on that <clears throat> agree completely the word gifts you use there and the mm. both quotes use the word generosity uh and i think there's something about generosity that's at the heart of of our response to what's happening in the country at the moment, uh, are uh, something at the heart of our response to working for a, a fairer society. So Paul urges generosity in his epistles, mm. uh, and we Christians should be encouraging and showcasing uh, generosity. And, and I think Archbishop Andy himself invited churches to, uh, I think the phrase was, be practitioners of generosity. And I, I like it. that. I like that. Practitioners of generosity. And he said that congregations should donate 10 boxes of, of basic items for food bank distribution mm. um, during during Advent. And, and I preached on that on Sunday. And the fact that food banks exist, the fact that ventures like pantries exist in 21st century Wales is appalling, absolutely appalling. But they do exist and people are in need. So, and the need is increasing. The need is increasing in light of the cost of living crisis. So we still need that generosity. We need to be calling yeah. out uh, those who are in charge uh, of our country politically, that this is appalling they exist. But we also need as Christians to have that generosity of heart and to be giving, uh, not just giving food, uh, but charities are really struggling at the moment, really, really yeah, struggling because really are. people are having to make choices about whether they heat their house, eat or give to charity. And heat, give to charity is third on the list. Yeah. Um, so charities are struggling so we can give financially as well. And then, of course, as as Barry said earlier, there's our generosity in opening churches, opening church halls as as warm spaces, warm hubs for those who are struggling to heat their homes. Uh, that, of course, relies on churches being able to pay for their own heating and their own electricity. And as a vicar, I know that is a huge ask in itself. It's no longer a given that churches and church halls uh, are going to be heated, but we can still help. We can still help and churches, um, Christians can join forces with other public bodies, with charities, just to continue reaching out. And what we see as doing God's work, uh, sharing God's love, God's compassion, God's justice in our society. And for Christians, I think we have to be reminded that we have to be generous because God has been generous towards yeah, us. That's, that's the it. basis of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, we give because we have first received. Um, it's because we have been given so much that we have received the love of God. It's that love we dare not keep to ourselves. Mm. We, uh, we must share that abroad. Um, mm. in our world. And that's the basis of it. That's a kind of theological basis of why Christians should be outgoing and generous and loving and caring. Yeah. Because God, that. that's the character of God. Yeah, well, we, something... we had a, a youth service last week, uh, an Advent youth service. It was wonderful. These 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds had done the whole service and put it together. And on the screens, they decided to use a, an advert uh, that it was out about five or six years ago for John Lewis, a Christmas advert. Uh, other superstores and uh, department stores <laughs> are available. Um, but but it was a wonderful, you might remember it, of a little boy that's so excited for Christmas Day. And he's yeah. waiting and waiting and waiting. <clears throat> and you just presume he's excited excited for his presence but when it comes to Christmas Day he runs he ignores his own presence runs to a cupboard gets a present for his mum and dad out and takes it to them and it's that that's what we need we need that to grasp that excitement of we've been gifted things from God we've been gifted life the joy of life uh, and we need to now give back and that needs to be a good thing uh, despite of the horrible things that are happening in yeah. the country at the moment we need to be positive and think we can do something yeah, I, it's something I always think about when I'm um, going up for <clears throat> communion, 
because uh, again, having read uh, Radcliffe's book, I was thinking about the ritual of, of communion. And, you know, when you take the communion, I sit there and you say a prayer afterwards. But then I just say to myself, remember the taste, remember the texture, remember how you feel right now as mm -hmm. you leave the church. Because the worst thing in the world is hearing a sermon that has inspired you to go out into the world and be that practitioner of generosity. And then by the time you get home, you've just forgotten everything that you've just spent an hour feeling uh and and that i think is is the the call as a christian i think it's also the cost of discipleship as well that we have to bring this into our daily lives you know and i and i find myself thinking a lot of times where i'm spending money on things and i'm like really could i could that money be going somewhere else you know and those are the kind of challenges that the church gives me every day and i think it would be far much far easier if i wasn't a christian <laughs> I <would. Yeah. laughs> but i think that's part of the course isn't it it's not supposed to be an easy life <laughs> once said that the two most important parts of the church are the altar and the porch um, because you receive at the altar, God gives you of himself at the altar, and then you go out to shed the world, go out into the world, uh, yeah. you, you know, uh, in order to, 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 to show that love to the world. Um, I've, I've now forgotten the Eucharistic prayer at, at the end. Um, Tristan, you have to remind me. Yeah, well, well, it's exactly what I was going to say. It links beautifully to what you've just said. You know, that's the most important parts of the church. I hadn't heard of that, the most important areas. But the most yeah. important words in the Eucharistic service, you could say, are go forth go. in peace to love and serve the Lord. Um, oh, and of course, that's where in Latin the word mass comes from. That's right. Uh, you say, go, go, go out. And so really, yeah. they are the most important words of our yeah. services. Go yeah. out and love and serve the world. Uh, so the Lord, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good, 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 good. Come yeah. back there, Justin. <laughs> Do you know what? I can't wait to go to church on Sunday now. I'm going to be literally right at the altar, coming out on the Sunday. Come on, world, coming to get you. Okay, sorry. Um, I've run out of all the books that I've uh, I've currently read on theology, so I got nothing. I got no literature to bring to you now. But I got another question because um, I think what we often hear about as well is that phrase, "God helps those who help themselves." How do you react to a phrase? like that oh goodness me that sounds to me like the uh, american um, uh, prosperity gospel you know that god only um helps those who are prosperous and if you're not yeah. prosperous it's because you've been cursed by god I, it seems to me that nothing could be further from the truth yeah. i think i could m make a case really that that god helps those who cannot help themselves that's the whole mm. thrust of what yes. we've been saying really isn't it mm. that god is on the side of the poor and the disadvantaged and and those who have nothing uh, and and therefore he helps all those um who who um cannot help themselves quite frankly so it's the exact opposite of it i think yeah, yeah I, I would agree it's 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 completely alien to my own spirituality mm -hmm. my own faith that kind of idea that god helps those who help themselves in the context of of poverty we've talked about that there's there's nothing biblical uh, about that kind of, of statement. Uh, in Genesis, God looks at the world and sees that it is tov meod. It's very good. So God's intention for creation is that there should be no shortages. Uh, we've been gifted, as we've talked about, more than is sufficient for our needs. And then you have, of course, the Levitical laws, the Deuteronical, Deuteronomical laws that, that, that are all about care, for the environment, care for the vulnerable, care for the marginalised. And as we've said, we have the prophets raging against the injustices of the day. So we ourselves should be raging against today's injustices, ensuring that we provide for those who are uh, the, who need. When you think of it, that's what the early church did. It's clear yeah. from the book of Acts yeah. that the church of disciples dedicated time, dedicated um, uh, resources to, to meeting the immediate needs of the vulnerable. So it's clear from scripture that the that, that poverty, that poverty in some ways contradicts the will of God. And so we as Christians yeah. need to do everything we can for others not expect others to do things for themselves. We need yeah. to nurture communities that don't leave people behind. Communities where no child goes to, to school hungry. Uh, communities where uh, no parent has to make a choice between feeding their children or feeding themselves. 
uh, communities where no young person has to eat, eat raw food because they can't afford to put their hob on in their student halls uh, and communities where no pensioner should have to choose to sit in a cold house just so they can eat their daily bread. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we, you know, we are people for others. Uh, I think that was Bonhoeffer, the, 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 yeah. Jesus was a man for others. We are people for others. We no, should not expect people to help themselves. God, God helps those who help themselves. Put those against the, the words of Mary's song in the Magnificent. He has put down the mighty from their seat and the rich he has sent empty away. Mm. Um, and God, you know, who there is, identifies himself um, with the poor. And of course, um, you know, he comes to a, a, an unknown part of the Roman Empire. Um, who'd ever heard of Palestine, uh, for mm -hmm. example? And, and he's brought up in Nazareth, uh, not the uh, garrison, a, a town of Sephora that was a few miles away from it. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, all of that, uh, I think, is of a piece with the kind of God God is. Today. Um, there's one for Bishop Barry, really. Um, how can we engage with others, do you think, to work for a fairer society? Well, I mean, I think it's it's true to say that although it's fundamental to the Christian faith that we should be supporting others, there are lots of people there who have no belief system, but who are enormously compassionate and who are really worried about um, the poverty in our country, which mm. Christian, uh, uh, Tristan has just pointed out to us uh, 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 about how people are actually suffering. So, in fact, we need to work with others. It's not a, 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 it's not a peculiar uh, concern of Christians. It's a concern for people of compassion. I think we can also work with supermarkets. I mean, um, in persuading supermarkets, for example, to not throw away perfectly good food mm. at the end of the day. They're beginning, I think, to do things like that, to distribute food um, to the poor. We can also, I think, press supermarkets to um, produce basic food a bit more cheaply. And then, of course, we've got to press governments in order to do something about social housing, about benefits. I mean, I, I read this week that um, a cross-party um, committee in the Senate here in Cardiff Bay said that there were lots of help available um, for people who were on benefits. But in order to access them, they had to fill in six or seven complicated forms. And the result was that people just couldn't do it. They couldn't hack it. They couldn't, they couldn't cope with it. And I know sometimes, you know, how they feel because uh, I'm sometimes sent forms and they're so complicated and convoluted that you kind of give up um, and, and you can understand them. Um, so it's, it's trying to get the system that's already there for some people to work um, properly. And also perhaps to persuade the government that, you know, you can't, children cannot have school meals if their parents earn more than £7,400 a year. Now that's appalling when we hear that there are people, there are kids going to school with lunch boxes, but there's nothing in them mm. because they don't like to show other people that they are in fact without any kind of food at all. And when you think about it, 7,400, which one of us could live on 7,400 a year, but people have to live on, on, on that. But if you earn that money, then your children don't qualify for free school meals. Now, that's absolutely appalling. And at the same time, we're hearing about um, the millions of pounds that were squandered on PPE contracts and all the rest of it. Now, I don't want to go into all of that. <laughs> but, you know, when you, talk, when you think about the millions that have been spent and squandered on lots of other projects, um, this is very little in comparison. And it took Marcus Rashford, of course, yeah. um, to push... Um, for free school meals um, during holidays for children. And, and I think that if we can join with people of goodwill in, in, in pressing and campaigning, um, then that too helps. I, I completely agree with you. And I think um, what, what I really love what you said about that, because you made that analogy at the beginning about it's, you know, you've got to fix the path as yes, well. I 
um, because, you know, there's no good just providing this stuff because you're not really then doing anything to change it. What I've noticed um, with working on the food and fuel <laughs> campaign is the amount of behind the scenes stuff that goes on with lobbying the Welsh Government, speaking to AMs and MPs. Yeah. And I think for me, that is a really key part and probably something that most people don't know that the church does and gets involved yeah. in. Now, Bishop, you know, I, I, fo I followed you when in a previous job, so I knew what, what you, Archbishop, um, in your role, I knew what you were doing and you were, you know, constantly speaking out on these things and meeting with people. And for me, that is a, a church I'd want to belong to that it's not just providing the food banks because, you know, food banks, we got more food banks than we've got McDonald's, you know, mm. and that's not, you know, and we can't contribute to that. We've got to do something to stop it as well. Um, and the, the lobbying side of things and the campaign side of things is, I think, hugely important. And collectively across Wales, gathering those stories and saying this is the reality of what it's like for our communities in Wales. That's what changes people's opinions because you're now taught, you're putting a face to the figures yep. and saying, you know, there are real people, real people who are suffering here. Um, and and that's that I think is where the church can do it because we're in those communities hearing those stories um, and we need to we need to sh share those stories far and wide. Tristan, I got a question for you then. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because you've written a book um, uh, a few years ago um, about uh, the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. OK, and I think you described the Lord's Prayer in your book as a radical call mm -hmm. to action and social justice. Where do you see things like prayer and fasting sit within a prophetic and radical engagement with the world? It's it's a good question. We <clears throat> sometimes feel, you know, even what we just heard um, Bishop Barry talk about then, <clears throat> we sometimes feel helpless when we face the problems that we see in our, our society. Uh, but prayer reminds us that faith is about hope. Uh, that that's that's at the at the heart of faith is is hope. Uh, and that's where prayer and spiritual exercises collide beautifully with prophetic and radical uh, engagement with the world. As Christians, we believe that God is at work in the world. And so our prayer really matters. <clears throat> and prayer matters objectively, but it also matters subjectively as well. I remember reading Desmond Tutu talking about prayer uh, and he describes prayer as sitting in front of a uh, of a, a warm fire. And when you sit in front of a warm fire, you become warm yourself, just as uh, when we pray to a loving God, we become <laughs> part of that love ourselves. It makes us more loving when we spend time in the presence of a loving God. So prayer <clears throat> strengthens us. <clears throat> it inspires us to be God's feet, God's hands, God's voice uh, in the world. I, I've used a little African proverb so many times. If anyone's heard me speak before, I've repeated this countless times, but I love it, which is when you pray, move your feet. When you pray, move your feet. There's something hugely mm. profound about that. Prayer is essential, but remaining on our knees after we've prayed is not an option. Uh, <laughs> Pope Francis said something about, um, I can't remember the exact way he said it, but he said, he, when, when he was asked about prayer, he said, you pray that the hungry are fed, and then you get up off your knees and you feed the hungry. That is how prayer works. Wow. Uh, and again, we can look at the model of Jesus um, uh, as to how he did it. It's no coincidence, as, as Barry said earlier, that Jesus began his ministry reading from the book of Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's sent me to proclaim good news for the poor. But Jesus' life is not just marked by social action. Jesus' life is marked by social action and prayer by fighting for justice and prayer, by compassion and prayer. Uh, it's a balance. We need to model ourselves on that. A balance, prayer and action. Yep. Um, Contemplative action, you could call it, could call it, call it, or you could just say that little proverb again, when you pray, move your feet. Your feet. 
that just reminded me of, 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 of the grace that I sometimes use. You know, we pray that the hungry may be fed and those who are fed may hunger after justice and mm. righteousness. Um, yeah. Fasting, of course, has been uh, important in the Christian tradition. Um, the importance of it is it's we're not just slave to our appetites. It's a it's a healthy reminder of that. Um, but also to by fasting. I mean, we share in a very, very minute way in um, what it is to be without food for a mm. certain period of time. Mm. We can't emulate what it must be like for people who literally have nothing. Uh, but nevertheless, we can perhaps at least just for uh, a day put ourselves into their shoes. Prayer, well, I can't better what um, Tristan has said. Um, of course, prayer is important, but some people think that um, when you pray to God, what you are doing is persuading God to do something uh, that you wouldn't otherwise do. Um, actually, what you're doing is opening yourself out um, to God's will in order that the good that both you and he desire may come into effect. And that actually it's opening yourself out. That's what worship is about too. It's opening yourself out to the influence of God's Holy Spirit in order for you um, to be more compassionate and loving and do God's work uh, in the world. That's what I see uh, as prayer. So it's not enforcing our will on God, but enabling God's will to be done in and through us. Well, when, when you were speaking about fasting, it reminded me, um, again, we've we've quoted a lot of people, haven't we? In this <laughs> yeah. last Go on, show off who else have you got in your, in your uh, theology toolkit there? <laughs> exactly. But this is actually a person from, from outside of the Christian tradition. Um, and it's Gandhi's uh, phrase, we must live simply so others may simply live. <laughs> And there is wow. something about it, isn't it? Spiritual exercises allow us to do that. And even going without food for the day frees up a bit of finances to be able to give to those charities that are so uh, suffering at the moment. So, yeah, live simply so others may simply live is, 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 a, is a great little uh, uh, summary of, of, of spiritual exercises to me. Since um, I, I find morning prayer the most um, uplifting start to the day, mainly because it kind of gives you a bit of a fire in your belly as well. I think, you know, it's it's a it's, some people think it's a nice gentle start to the day, and it is in so many <laughs> respects, isn't it? But then you you know you read the 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 the, the prophets or you read the passages and you're like, oh come on. <laughs> 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 it really fires you up. So, I mean, I think you've just completely sold everyone on prayer with what you've both said. That is uh, phenomenally good. And I um, I completely agree with you on that. Final thoughts before we wrap up this, this what I think has been an incredibly uh, wonderful and enriching conversation, which I've learned a lot. Uh, any final thoughts on um, our, our, our quest for justice? Uh, in the church. Tristan, anything you'd like to say that you haven't covered? But I just I just think uh, for those of us in in ministry areas, mission areas, parishes, mm -hmm. um, just to be aware of people in your congregations, because we we can very easily um, talk about these kind of necessary actions and generosity uh, and be encouraging fellow Christians to come along with us and then miss the fact that some of those fellow Christians are the ones who are struggling in the first place. Um, I heard a story recently of a, uh, of a vicar who had found in his congregation that there were far less people um, ask, uh, asking for pastoral visits to go to their house. Um, and then he worked out it's because they couldn't afford the heat on in their houses. Um, so he started saying to people, do you want to meet me in the cafe? And then he had far more people, all these people that he thought Whoa, didn't want to speak really? to him, suddenly wanted to speak to him in the cafe because they, they were embarrassed that, you know, so there are people who are struggling who you just won't know in your congregation. So be aware, uh, open your eyes and, and allow God's spirit to, to lead you to, to, to see the problems within your own congregations and your own communities, not just uh, those communities which we know are suffering dreadfully. Brilliant. Thank you, Tristan. Bishop Barry, any final thoughts? No, I think we've covered everything. I'm just very glad that um, the Church in Wales is involved in this campaign because it goes to the heart of what it is to be a Christian. It goes to the heart, in fact, of what it is to be 
a human being. Mm. Um, you know, the glory of God is a human being um, fully alive, as one of the church fathers put it. And you can't be fully alive if you are hungry and poor and desperate and cold. Um, and therefore, anything we can do to alleviate that by whatever means um, has got to be a good thing. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for your time and for your insight as well. That was a wonderful conversation. And for those of you who are watching, if you'd like to know more about the Food and Fuel campaign, go to uh, churchinwales.org.uk and search Food and Fuel. It's on the front page of the website. Please sign up to the newsletter. Please sign up to the letter that we're uh, an open letter to supermarkets, uh, calling on them to do more to tackle the cost of living crisis and uh, please encourage um, more of your congregations new people to get involved in this campaign so that we can help change people's lives too thank you very much both and uh, i'll catch up with you soon bye-bye bye bye, bye. bye.